The Office for Victims of Crime is committed to enhancing the nation's capacity to assist crime victims and to providing leadership in changing attitudes, policies, and practices to promote justice and healing for all victims of crime. Points of view expressed in this video do not represent the official position of the United States Department of Justice. In an unprecedented action, John Gillis, the director of the Office for Victims of Crime, traveled around the United States to meet with crime victims firsthand to discuss their experiences with the criminal justice system. A series of roundtable meetings were held in nine states, with 30 states represented and over 300 participants. After careful analysis of the informative and heartfelt opinions expressed, there were certain areas of consistency that emerged. The issues focused on both the problems that exist in the criminal justice system and the needed remedies from the perspective of crime victims. This program series captures and reflects some of the key findings of the roundtable discussions. The series includes a total of five thematic videos on topics ranging from the financial impact of crime on victims to victim notification and basic case information. The opinions expressed are emblematic of many of the participants and is a way in which the Office for Victims of Crime has given a voice to victims. So the one way that I feel that we need to find out how we help you is by going out and meeting with people outside the Beltway, uh, going out and talking with crime victims, meeting the individuals at the grassroots level who are doing the work and who are doing it for the right reasons, not because they're being paid, but because they care about what they're doing. So I want to use this as an opportunity to find out from you how we can best help you at the grassroots level, how we can best do some of the things that will help you get through the tragedies that you've all suffered. You have a crime scene, you, you, you have a criminal there, but you also have a victim. Just because that person, unfortunately, is no longer living, you've still got their family, their loved ones, who, are, who be ultimately become the victims of this crime. And we need the proper attention and treatment. That when my daughter was killed, before I, we went to see her, I called the police and I asked them, how was she shot? I wanted to prepare myself so I uh, keep it together. And the chief of police told me that was confidential information. And I said, what? And anyway, and I raised my voice and he said, you're raising your voice with me. And I said, well, you would be upset too if that was your daughter that was murdered. He hung up on me. Someone who has not had the experience of um, having a child murdered uh, has a very natural tendency to insulate themselves from the anger and the emotional upheaval that we're demonstrating. Um, so a lot of the professionals that we've spoken with to try to educate about um, notification and um, follow-up are... Um, very naturally trying to avoid being tuned into us. We all know all too well that first it's the long trials, if you're lucky enough to get to trial. Then it's the delays, then it's appeals, it's the parole hearings, no truth in sentencing, more parole hearings. We're truly sentenced to life. And if you've never got to have that trial, you're sentenced to life even more because you're not going to let loose. It's sheer torture. I can't speak about accountability enough. And I think that when we talk about the reaction of the first responders, I think that you know we need to ensure that this is extremely important that folks know up front what their rights are. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and, and when you're talking with someone, who recently uh, just experienced someone being murdered, they're not going to remember the things that they need to do. And, that, and that's the reason why you know, I can't emphasize enough that you know, we need to have something that is available for families that they can refer back to a day later. 
We are simply interested in justice being served and not b being kicked around by the justice system who is supposed to be serving us. One of the things that they constantly bring uh, up is, uh, and they say it directly, first of all, this was not a crime against you. It was a crime against the state. Now, we know that intellectually, but it was my child who was dead, okay? And somewhere there needs some, to be some uh, sensitivity uh, to that issue. He told me, um, um, I don't want to prosecute, uh, I want to plead this out. Uh, I said, well, um, I don't care if we win or lose. I need this to go to trial. Um, I need some answers. I don't, you know, I've already lost. My daughter's dead. I mean, I have nothing to lose. Six months in prison is the agreement. I, that's nothing. Um, prosecute this. Um, he said, no, this is uh, not your case. Um, and I said, well, this is not your daughter. And he dislocated my jaw. And uh, then he tore off all my clothes, uh, all my night clothes, and uh, uh, proceeded to rape me for two, and sodomize me, one and the other, for two hours. What I'd like to see, and what I would like to have had available to me is someone to have called and just say, look into this for me. Um, can you, um, I don't know if it's in, within the realm of your possibilities, but to go down to the state level, go down to the county level, um, to uh, look at what the prosecutor's doing and the investigators are doing, and um, uh, make sure they're doing their jobs. Make sure they're not worried about their conviction rates. Make sure they're not worried so much about how much it's going to cost the county to um, prosecute these cases. And I told her, wait until the court case, and then they won't have any ammunition. And I can get on a stand and t really tell what happened to me. And uh, she said, when is this court case? And I said, I'll find out. So I called the police, and this policewoman had found out, and she was in the kitchen when I got back from my Baha'i meeting, and she said, there's not going to be any court case. You know, I it's going to be a plea bargain. And I was so mad at the county at the attorneys, this was the county of Belknap, his insisting on a plea bargain and cutting in half what I wanted this man to get for jail. And I wanted him confined because, of course, he isn't a normal human being. These people ought to be confined because they are redoers of what they like to do so much. And every time they rape, they are more vicious until they kill. The organizations, Family and Friends Victims of Violent Crimes, POMC, NOVA, the, uh, so many of them, um, I think on a local level, educating your local police force and pushing for victim advocates. I went into the court and I was told I had this right to speak at sentencing. And uh, the judge looked at me and he said, well, yes, you have this right and I can't deny you that right, but my mind's already made up and I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, but you go ahead and speak. At uh, the point of um, uh, giving an impact statement, the judge, um, he was always very nonchalant, but he just said, well, Ms. Barfield, your boys were out looking for trouble. And I said, Judge, did, do you, are you trying to say that my children deserve to be shot? The judge fell asleep during our trial. We saw her nod off two or three times. There was a couple of times she came into the courtroom and said, so what are we going to do today? And that just kind of shows you how maybe some judges act or do. And, you know, we're talking about the murder of someone, and that doesn't set very well, obviously. I think that, you know, one thing we need to do definitely is we need to educate the judges, we need to educate the prosecutors, because the law is definitely on the side of the perpetrator. With cold cases, I, I think that one of the thing may help uh, people who are, are, are still have unresolved cases or unsolved cases, if the, the, um, somebody in law enforcement would at least acknowledge that, that crime, a crime has occurred and that they haven't forgotten and just put those cases in the archives and just maybe write a, two or three little 
sentence lying to the major member of the family and says, you know, the, the case is not resolved, but we haven't closed it. I mean, you know, we, we may have to go to the archives to pull it out. I really think we need to put a lot of uh, more attention on cold cases because, as I said in the beginning, it took me 14 years to resolve, um, to get some kind of um, resolution to my son's, uh, having my son's perpetrator put in jail. I do thank you for taking the time to spend with us today. I wish you didn't have to do it. I wish we were here under different circumstances because none of us chose to have a tragedy happen in our lives. But now that it has happened, let's see that we can let's see if we can take advantage of that and try and help others who have to follow so that they don't have to suffer the same pain that we've suffered. So thank you. The following is a summary of the key points made during this program. Information and communication are the key desires for crime victims. Accountability on the part of the various participants in the criminal justice system process is critical to the well-being of crime victims. Victim death notification is extremely important and needs to be done more sensitively. Training in this area is critical to avoiding further damage being done to crime victims. Cavalier or self-protective attitudes on the part of criminal justice system professionals can be very hurtful to crime victims. It is important to acknowledge unsolved cases and to routinely contact family members with case status information. It is critical that criminal justice system professionals respect a victim's right to be heard. Victims groups should work to educate their local police and victim advocacy agencies on working with crime victims. Through the Enhancing Police Response to Victims Project, the International Association of Chiefs of Police is designing a strategy and toolkit of resources for law enforcement agencies to improve their response to victims of crime. First Response to Victims of Crime, a guidebook for law enforcement officers, is a handbook to help line officers better understand and meet the needs of victims of crime, both victims of particular types of crimes and specific populations of victims. The Office of Victims of Crime has funded the development of training curricula and other resources to improve death notification among criminal justice and allied professionals. OVC provided funding to Mothers Against Drunk Driving to develop and deliver training for clergy and funeral directors, crime victim advocates, law enforcement, and medical personnel to instruct these professionals in providing compassionate and thorough death notification. OVC provided funding to the American College of Emergency Physicians to collaborate with MAD to train emergency physicians and residents to give proper death notification to families after the loss of a loved one. OVC is also supporting the development of training and technical assistance tools for corrections-based personnel. Curricula currently under development include training for community-based corrections officers on recognizing indicators of elder abuse the impact of crime on victims, and improving restitution management. OVC funded the International Homicide Investigators Association. IHIA is developing standard protocols and procedures for handling unidentified remains and training on those protocols and procedures for law enforcement, medical examiners, coroners, prosecutors, victim advocates, and others. OVC funded the development of a training video for advocates, criminal justice practitioners, and others to raise awareness for crime victims whose cases involve DNA evidence. A companion video, First Response to Victims of Crime, highlights many of the topical areas covered in the guidebook.